All right, party people, today we're going over pitting versus non-pitting edema. When I say pitting edema, I mean when you take your finger and you see a patient with a swollen area, you put your finger into that area, applying pressure on the skin. If it leaves an indentation, that is the pitting we are talking about. And usually it's bilateral. Now, in terms of causes of pitting edema, let's get it. First, we can talk about cardiogenic causes. So typically due to right heart failure. This causes blood pressure to back up into the systemic veins, leading to increased hydrostatic pressure. This causes fluid to leak into the interstitial space. The leaked fluid is classified as transudate, meaning it is low in cells, protein, and LDH. If edema is due to left heart failure, the mechanism is the exact same because you have increased hydrostatic pressure, but localized to the pulmonary circulation instead of the systemic veins. This pressure can back up into the right side of the heart and in turn, cause exactly the same type of right heart failure. The most common cause of right heart failure is left heart failure. Now, in terms of a question, you might be wondering why systemic hypertension, for example, blood pressure 200 over 120, doesn't lead to peripheral edema. It's because the arterioles provide a high resistance, which prevents excessive pressure from reaching the capillary beds. Therefore, arterioles are the major site of vascular resistance, and they keep the papillary hydrostatic pressure within a normal range. Another cause could be hepatic. So in cirrhosis, the liver produces less albumin, resulting in decreased oncotic pressure within the vasculature. Without adequate oncotic pressure, fluid leaks into the interstitial space. This causes edema. Ascites in cirrhosis may involve both decreased oncotic pressure and increased hydrostatic pressure. This is specifically found in the portal vein. This is due to portal hypertension. You may be asked to recognize either one of these causes. We have nephrogenic causes, such as nephrotic syndrome, where the kidneys lose a large amount of protein over three grams per day. This results in low serum albumin and decreased oncotic pressure. This again leads to transudative fluid shift into the interstitium, causing the edema. Examples of nephrotic syndromes are Minimal change disease, most common in children, often follows a viral illness. This presents with periorbital or pedal edema, so swelling around the eyes and the feet. Now, no change is seen on light microscopy, but effacement of podocyte foot processes is found on electron microscopy. Another cause of nephrotic syndrome can be membranous nephropathy. This is seen in adults. Causes include anti-PLA2R antibodies. Also solid tumors such as breast or pancreatic can cause this. Autoimmune diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis and drugs such as gold salts or sulfonamides can also induce membranous nephropathy. Another cause could be diabetic nephropathy. This is non-enzymatic glycation leading to glomerular basement membrane thickening, mesangial expansion, and eventual loss of the filtration barrier. Up next, we have focal segmental glomerulosclerosis, FSGS. This is common in African-American patients, HIV-positive patients, heroin users, and SLE patients. Amyloidosis. This is seen in patients with multiple myeloma. Light chains form deposits in various organs, including the heart and kidneys. Congo red stain shows apple green biorefringents under polarized light. This is buzzword stuff you have to know. All right, let's get into drug-induced edema. So, dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers, such as amlodipine and nifedipine, are classic culprits. This is high yield for step two in family medicine. Patients may present with puffy legs and forearms. If they give you a patient with random edema, Without giving you any indications or causes, make sure to check what medications they have started recently. So verapamil, a non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker, is more associated with constipation, not edema. And imatinib, a tyrosine kinase inhibitor for CML, can also cause peripheral edema. This is less common, but it is testable. They might catch you with it, so know that. A dietary cause could be severe protein malnutrition. This can be seen in patients running goofy diets. So if you have extreme dieting, very restrictive regimen where the protein intake is restricted to the point where they're not able to make and synthesize enough protein to keep the oncotic pressure maintained would lead to pitting edema. Another cause could be pregnancy. Now, small amounts of peripheral edema is normal during pregnancy due to IVC compression by the uterus. Management includes advising the patient to sleep with a pillow under their right side to reduce the IVC compression. If there is severe dyspnea and edema, especially postpartum, you must consider peripartum cardiomyopathy. The first step in diagnosis is transthoracic echo to assess for the ejection fraction. Risk of maternal and fetal complications increases with each subsequent pregnancy if ejection fraction is reduced. All right, now getting into non-pitting edema. 
Non-pitting edema means that when you press into a swollen area, it does not leave an indentation. And unlike pitting edema, which is usually bilateral, non-pitting edema is often unilateral. A common cause of non-pitting edema can be malignancy, particularly when you have lymphatic obstruction. For example, inflammatory breast carcinoma can involve the Cooper's ligament, which tether the skin and give dimples or peau d'orange appearance that literally results in the breast tissue looking like the skin of an orange. Other causes of lymphatic obstruction include iatrogenic effects, such as surgical removal of a lymph node, for example, during mastectomy, can lead to chronic lymphatic insufficiency. This, in turn, can result in a condition called stewart trevez syndrome. It's rare, but it's important in the development of lymphangiosarcoma of the affected limb. This can present years after surgery with violaceous, aka purple slash red, raised lesion on the arm, commonly in areas like the antecubital fossa. Even if you're not familiar with stewart trevez syndrome, you can kind of reason your way there because if they mention chronic lymphatic insufficiency followed by vascular type lesions, the answer you could kind of get to would be lymphangiosarcoma, another cause of non-pitting edema, Wuchereria bancrofti. This is a nematode, a roundworm spread by female mosquitoes. It causes elephantiasis or massive limb enlargement due to lymphatic obstruction. A lower yield but relevant cause is thyroid disease, particularly Graves. In this case, you can see pretibial myxedema due to mucopolysaccharide deposition in the skin. And remember, a mucopolysaccharide is a glycosaminoglycan. Graves' disease can also cause exophthalmos. This is protrusion of the eyes for the same reason. If a question describes a patient with hyperthyroidism but explicitly says there's no pretibial myxedema or eye involvement, that's their way of telling you that it's not Graves. It could be de Quervain's thyroiditis, toxic multinodular goiter, or toxic adenoma. So just as a summary, pitting edema is more common and high yield because it involves cardiac, hepatic, renal, drug-related, or pregnancy-related causes. And non-pitting edema is less common, but you have to be able to recognize lymphatic obstruction, such as cancer, surgeries, parasites, or Graves' disease, and thyroid-related causes. So that's it for this one. Go crush it.